I mean, for me, growing breasts, I mean, I would just get up in the morning and look in the mirror, and I would despair. It was like, these, I don't, these don't belong to me. Or starting to menstruate as, as a boy. I mean, I was just, it was confusing, and I had no language for it. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. It was just like you're in this, you're in this um, drama that is your life, and the only way is just to continue that yeah. progression. Systems are an essential part of any society, and labels and categories are essential for systems to operate effectively. But when it comes to labeling people, things start to fall apart. We can't choose our parents or the bodies we're given. And from birth, for most of us, we're led down a path of predetermined steps that reinforce gender stereotypes or labels. For those that don't conform to the gender label, a lifetime of challenges awaits. So welcome to another episode of Inside Out. And joining me today is Lyndon Jordan. Lyndon's going to share his journey, which started out as Lyndon many years ago, and eventually, when he transitioned, became Lyndon Jordan. Currently, Lyndon's president of a PFLAG in Skagit. In the past, you've been a, an attorney, <laughs> mental health counselor, and a college professor. In search of a career. In search of a career. <laughs> I don't believe that, but yeah. <laughs> Welcome, anyway. Thanks, Thank thanks for joining us. Um, I want to kind of take a journey th through your, your life, if, if that's possible, and ask you questions along the way. Sure. Um, but just, just right at the beginning, can you just explain what transitioning means? I mean, I, I understand that, but maybe some of the people watching this don't. Probably the simplest way to explain it is that when we're born, we are assigned a sex at birth. And we have two choices. Uh, we're male or we're female. And what goes into that assignment is basically looking at uh, a baby's anatomy. And um, anatomy can be ambiguous, but most of the time there is either a penis or there is a vulva, and it's fairly easy to tell. Um, what that doesn't take into account, though, is probably the brain function that has to do with one's sense of self, one's sense of gender. And so sometimes there's a mismatch between those two. So someone who may have been assigned female at birth, like myself, comes to learn fairly quickly that, that that's not accurate for them, that their feeling of what this gender thing is, is sometimes the exact opposite mm. of what the birth certificate says. So I, I think that's probably the simplest way to describe what transgender is. Yeah, yeah. Unlike cisgender, which is a term that's used for people who they feel consistent with that assignment at birth. So starting r right at the beginning of the story, I guess, w at what stage did you, did you start to feel that there was something not, not right, as it were, or that was contrary to the information that you were receiving? It, it, that's a really wonderful question that everybody always has, is when do we begin to know what our gender is? I could, I could turn that question back on you, and I could say, well, Okay, John, when did you know? When did you know what your gender was? And for people who are cisgender, a lot of times I just get this blank look on their face because mm -hmm. they don't even have a clue why I'm asked. Why would you ask that? Why yeah, would I yeah. attend to my gender? But most of us have a pretty solid sense of our gender at the ages of three or four. Could we, can we articulate that? I mean, we can articulate I'm a boy or I'm a girl. But maybe in a broader sense, we're not going to be able to articulate what all that means. So I would say that if someone had watched me at the age of three or four, what they would have seen was a kid that was playing with toys that didn't fit what girls usually play with. Hmm. I was playing with fire engines. You know, I was playing with guns. So I guess you, you would be considered a tomboy, as it were. Yeah, and for girls, that's cool. You know, yeah. girls get to be tomboys. It's yeah. a whole lot harder for trans kids who are assigned male at birth and have these female sure. characteristics. Yeah. So yeah, I was a tomboy. 
and people didn't pay much attention to that. Mm -hmm. um, At what point did that start to become noticeable, if that's the right word? Well, I think it was probably noticeable to my mother in particular because um, I, I didn't want to wear dresses. And it's a classic, you know, it's sort of a classic description. I didn't want to wear dresses. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do anything where I had to look any different than just t-shirts and, and jeans or, or overalls, you know, which is one of my favorite things to wear. Um, and I, I didn't want to play with girls. I didn't want to play with dolls. I wanted yeah. to be with the, with, the, with the boys in the neighborhood. Yeah, I was going to say, that your selection of friends would also reflect that? Right? Yes, it would reflect that. Mm. Um, and I had girlfriends, but, you know, one of my probably um, starkest memories eight, nine, ten, when you start playing house, and everybody's playing house, and everybody's being a mom, and they've got babies. I'm always the dad. I'm always the dad in those scenarios. And, you know, I take the mom out dancing, and I'm dancing, I'm the lead. And it's like, you know, my memory of that is just, um, that's just who I was. Mm -hmm. And your parents' response to that? Did that set off any kind of discussions, or? Um, I, I don't. There's a lot of my childhood I don't remember um, for various reasons, but one of which is my own discomfort that was becoming clear to me. The other part of this was, it became clear to me at around the age of five or six that I really liked girls. And when, when other kids, girls were talking about getting married and who's their boyfriend, you know, I don't talk about that, but to me, I'm, I'm, I'm having fantasies about girlfriends. I'm getting crushes on the the women in the church that we went to, you know. So w did this kind of escalate, as it were, or in, in increase in intensity around puberty? Or? Oh, my God, yes. Yeah, I mean, by the time I was 12, and starting to that point, I knew pretty clearly that, uh, and I knew the word homosexual at that point. I mean, this was 1962, but I was growing up in a little tiny town in West Virginia. A very conservative community, um, evangelical. We went to a Southern Baptist church. My parents were very religious. I knew the word homosexual, and I knew what the word meant. And at the age of 12, I solidly knew that that's who I was. I had no word for transgender. I thought that, that being homosexual just kind of meant that you felt more like a boy, maybe. Um, which I guess is just the only definition I had in my mind at that point. And what was going through your mind at that time? I mean, did you feel that was something that you needed to, to keep to yourself? Oh my or? gosh, yes. Oh yes, so I you, told. You, were, you had a lot of fear. I told no one about that because, you know, um, I don't, it is hard to explain this. A lot of us feel like we don't fit in. I mean, I think that's a really common thing as you're growing up. You don't feel like you fit. But there's something kind of fundamental about gender and about attraction, where there's so much pressure to conform to society's definition of who you are based on your assigned sex at birth. Mm -hmm. So there are all these things that roll out that you're supposed to do. And from my point of view, not doing them it wasn't just uncomfortable, but you know, in the words of my church language, it was an abomination. Mm. And I was going to hell, and I had a huge fear of going to hell. I mean, for me, growing breasts, I mean, I would just get up in the morning and look in the mirror, and I would despair. It was like, these, I don't, these don't belong to me. Or starting to menstruate as, as a boy, I mean, I was just, it was confusing, and I had no language for it. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. It was just like you're in this, you're in this um, drama that is your life, and the only way is just to continue that yeah. progression. So what, what, what point did you manage to articulate that and share, share that in confidence with somebody? When, when was the first time you were actually able to say to somebody, look, this, this is how I feel? To really put it into those words? Um, <laughs> or just to acknowledge it even to somebody too. Oh, um, probably 20, maybe. Wow, okay. Yeah, I mean, it was a so big... So it was a long time alone with your thoughts. Oh, yes, and meanwhile, I, I have girlfriends that I'm actually involved with. 
and um, sort of the pinnacle of, of all of it came to roost when I was 21 and I had been living with a woman for three years that I was deeply in love with. And she had been very clear with me that she was not homosexual, she was not lesbian. She was with me until she could find a, a guy that she was falling for. And so that's the first time that I put the word transgender to what I was, okay. because I became obsessed with finding a way to change my gender so that I could marry her. And I see, okay. And there was, I mean, there was no way. Yeah. Do you think she would have accepted you? No. Yeah. No. And I didn't even, I didn't even, I mean, we didn't even label ourselves to each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how kind of, um, what, what, what the level of secrecy is that yeah. goes with what I'm talking about here is there's, and in West Virginia, I had, I mean, my parents would have been, you know, appalled if I had mentioned sure. such a thing. And she broke my heart. She left. I was in graduate school and she left to do an internship and never spoke to me again. Gotcha. And it was just like, Pow! and I had no one, no one to talk to. I was incredibly uh, suicidal. It and was before like, that you hadn't had a, 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 a sexually active relationship? Not a sexually active one. relationship. Yeah. No, my, my first relationship was with my Sunday school teacher who was 11 years older than me. And that was when I was 17. And, but that was not a sexual relationship. That was a kind of hold hands, you know, pretend kind of thing. And your first kind of uh, serious relationship or deeper relationship? Or? That was uh, when I was a sophomore in college and um, I pledged a sorority, um, which was really interesting. Um, and I became the vice president of the sorority and fell in love with the girl who was the president of the sorority. So we were involved with each other um, during college and into our first year of graduate school. And I was desperately in love with her. I still dream about her. It's, and she just broke my heart. But she never, she never identified as homosexual. She always said to me, you know, I'm just, this is just a matter of time. I, I love you, but this is just going to be for a little while, and then I'm going to find a man I'm going to marry and have a family. And do you think that her path was about, she just wouldn't be able to deal with the consequences of coming yes. out? Yes. And, you know, for all, maybe she was bisexual. Yeah. Quite yeah. possibly. I mean, I, um, hard to say, but she did end up marrying a man and living with a man for many, many years. Um, how, how would you say your life was affected by the, the dissidence of, of, of what you felt and what you actually um, played out in life? I would say that that was the theme of my life, was the dissonance. Obviously, looking at culture as a kid and, you know, kind of what your genitals look like and what everybody else looks like that has those same genitals, um, it begins to become pretty clear. I, I didn't know anything about transgender, though. That word would not have been in my lexicon. I was growing up in a little tiny town in West Virginia, incredibly conservative area. My parents were fundamentalist Christian, um, kind of, you know, no playing cards, no dancing. I mean, they were pretty strict wow. about, about kind of activities. Um, so the thing that I was focused more on was becoming more aware that I liked girls and that I did not like boys in an attraction sort of way. And that became uh, the, my focal point um, because I knew that that was not acceptable. I had a lot of depression uh, during adolescence. Um, I was actively suicidal a couple of times during adolescence. Um, not uncommon for trans kids. Suicide, the, the attempted suicide rate for trans kids is 41%. 41% of trans people, if you ask them about their adolescence, they will tell you that they attempted suicide at least once. Um, so it's not uncommon because there's, I mean, even now, even though there's language, there's Laverne Cox, there's people that people can see that, that, that have, have, have good lives and are trans. Yeah. Um, even so, when it's you, 
and it's your family you're going to have to come out to, and it's your life you're going to have to construct and figure out some way that you're going to deal with that dissonance, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And to not have anybody to talk to about it is really devastating for kids. Who are, you, who are your role models growing up? I didn't have any. I didn't have any. I will tell you, though, that the first book I ever read about, this was in college, someone gave me a book called The Well of Loneliness. And this was one of the first books that was really written about being lesbian. And it was so depressing. I mean, I read that book, and so many of the people in the book had killed themselves. And I read that book, and it was just like, OK. Um, I had sort of had in my own mind that I would not live beyond the age of 30. So I would, I, when if I got to 30 and I was still this miserable, I would, I'd be done with it. And how did, how did media affect you? I mean, just sitcoms and the number of shows where, you know, a cross dresser or a trans person was just the butt of, of, of just cheap oh, jokes. Oh, it was terrible. That was terrible. I mean, again, it, but it wasn't, it wasn't any surprise. I mean, all that was doing was reinforcing what I was hearing all around me. I mean, I, I went to church five times a week sometimes. I mean, church was our primary social activity. And in that, in that structure system, um, you yeah, know, I was going to hell. And <laughs> I was terrified of hell. I'd, been, I'd heard about hell from the time I was, you know, two and three years of age because we'd been in the church that long. And I went to churches where hell was real. Ministers made it very real. Mm -hmm. And I would lay awake at night just terrified of going to sleep, thinking I was going to die, and then I was going to go to hell. So what, what pulled you out? What stabilized you? What started to give you confidence in yourself? Um, what stabilized me was college. Was I had a high school counselor who um, pulled me out and said, you're too smart not to go to college. I, I, you're going to sit here and you're going to fill this application She's smart to go to hell as well, I'm sure. Well, probably. <laughs> Uh, and my parents threw a fit. They, they, did, they gave me no help going to college. Um, they did allow me to live there, which was a mixed blessing. But, um, but I did it all by scholarship. I did it all by working while I was in college. And that was, that was when I began to see a different world. And then at the age of 26, I came out here to go to law school. And that was, a, that was the big difference in my life. It was, it was a women's movement. There was a huge lesbian community in Seattle. I came to Seattle to go to law school, and that was when the doors okay. began to open. And at this stage, were you living, was that still a, a secret, or had you come out? Or? I had, uh, after the, the woman I was in uh, graduate school with, after she left, left me, I ended up meeting another woman about a year and a half later, and we were in a relationship for about seven years. And we came out to the state of Washington together. She had, um, she had kids out in Washington. And she, we had to move to Washington because she was involved in a custody battle for her kids, and, uh, which she lost because she was in a lesbian relationship with me. So that was the state of the world. But things were changing. Things were changing, at least in Seattle. At what, what point would you say, say that you were um, you kind, kind of start, were able to kind of be open and align your career and your, your thoughts? And After law school, I went to law school to be a prosecutor. I wanted to work for, on behalf of uh, child victims of sexual abuse. I wanted to be a prosecutor. That was my sole purpose in going to law school. So I ended up getting a job at King County uh, Prosecutor's Office. And there I met a group of amazing women and began to meet a lot more uh, lesbian women who were professional, had careers, and you could see that you know, they had respect. And that, that was a huge door opening. And I worked there for about 10 years. Yeah. As far as the transitioning side of things, when did that start to occur to you as a possibility? It was always there. But meanwhile, life was going on. Hmm. And while I was in the prosecutor's office, uh, I met a woman that I ended up being with for 34 years. And 
She also did not identify as lesbian. She identified as bisexual. But we, we were together for that whole period of time. She had a couple of kids. We raised kids together. Mm -hmm. And transitioning was not going to work with her. And I knew that. That was not going to happen. So I just kind of shelved it and just thought, this, this, isn't gonna, this isn't in my cards. This isn't going to ever happen. And that's just the way it's going to have to be. But when I retired, and um, finally came face to face with the decision that I will never be who I really am. I talked with her about it and said, I'm thinking about transitioning. And she was very supportive. Um, we ended the marriage um, amicably for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and what, what I, was her, sorry, change, what, what was her biggest issue with that, do you think? Um, I, to be very honest, I think the biggest issue was that I was, I was becoming somebody that she really didn't know. I was, and I wanted to be that. I wanted to be a man. At this point in her life, she didn't really want to be with a man. Mm, okay. So it's at the point where it's like, I, I want to experience myself as in this whole set of things. And you know, in our relationship, we'd come to negotiations and agreements on a lot of things around intimacy, around sexual things. And it just, it wasn't what I wanted. And she knew it wasn't what I wanted. I wanted, I wanted to be fully as male as I could be, be who I was. And so we ended the marriage. My thought was, I'll never have another relationship. That's never gonna happen. Um, because who wants to be with somebody who's over 63 and is in the midst of puberty? Which I was when I started taking testosterone. <laughs> Can you describe that process? I mean, just in a... <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's, you know, acne. It's really increased libido. It's everything that happens. I mean, my body was changing. Uh, my facial features were changing. I was getting facial hair, which I was thrilled at. Um, and I, the, the, another part of the story that's, that's intriguing is in 1998, this was before I'd ever transitioned, this was 1998, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was an aggressive kind of breast cancer, and I was given a choice as to whether to have a lumpectomy and see what happened, or I could have bilateral mastectomies. Want to guess? <laughs> My surgeon just kind of looked at me and he said, I have never, ever worked with a woman as happy about having mastectomies as you are. And it was like, oh my God, it was wonderful. It was wonderful <laughs> to wake up after surgery and take those bandages off. So you and, weren't going to hell then? Oh, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, I didn't. Yeah, I'd long ago kind of, you know, mm -hmm. said goodbye to religion. No, it so, almost sounds like an affirmation as opposed to a curse. So. Well, you know, <clears throat> there it is. It's like, some people would have thought cancer was my punishment, you mm -hmm. know, for being who I was. But how long did the process take? Um, the actual transition. Yeah. yeah. Um, I st went up from the time I started taking hormones. Uh, uh, in, uh, about a year, within a year, my voice was this. I had gone from singing a high alto to singing baritone. I'm a musician. I'm a vocalist. I was in a band. And my bandmates just kept saying, we can't lower these songs anymore. Because I, my voice was just doom, 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 and it went really fast. It doesn't always, but mine did. And so I had to learn how to manage this new voice. Mm. And you know, I was, just, I was just changing in all kinds of different ways. And although you were constantly changing, did you feel that you were becoming more, I don't want to say authentic, but more more the person that you oh, felt you had to be. The mirror became my friend. I often say this to groups when I talk, is I am one of those people that I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror and what I see just delights me. It's like this, this, you know? So a lot of the work that you do now is, is around, um, I, I guess, uh, PFLAG, the organization, but I, I did watch one of your talks on the, the science of gender. Right. What motivates you? I, it's a rhetorical question almost, but what motivates you to do that? And what, what kind of re responses do you get? Um, oh, I, I get 
I've had amazingly positive responses. And, and, and one of the reasons that I think I feel so passionate about this is at 63 years of age, I'm retired. I'm financially secure. Um, I can't lose my job. I own my home. I can't be thrown out of my house. I, I don't have the same kind of risk that a lot of people have when they talk about this. So I'm, I look like a white male. It stuns people in my talk when at the end of my talk, sometimes I don't even say anything about being trans until the end of my talk, particularly if I'm talking to people older. Mm -hmm. I don't say a thing. They're just thinking I'm a white guy, just like most of the rest of them. And then I get to the end of the talk and I show those two photos of myself as a child in, a, in the flower girl dress and on the Roy Rogers horse. Right, right. And you just, I just watch people sit there and go, I mean, their mouths just drop. And it's like, that's beautiful. Because now they've really liked me. They've liked my talk. They thought it was interesting. But now they've got to reckon with the fact that I'm one of them. I'm one of them that they're talking about here. Is, is it important for you to be recognized as, 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 a, as a man now, yes. but also to be acknowledged in terms of what you've gone through as well. Right? You know, it's not, it's not that so much. Um, and it's not even being recognized as a man so much. If I had my way, we would wake up tomorrow and there would be nothing called gender. There, mm -hmm. None of us would be a gender. We would all just be human beings. However you want to dress, do it. However you want to wear your hair, whatever goes on, that's your thing. If it doesn't hurt me and it doesn't hurt the world at large, that's fine with me. So, However, that's not the world we live in. Hmm. And I feel like my mission with PFLAG right now is to try and help parents understand these kids and that this is real. Hmm. So just going into detail a little bit of that, PFLAG stands for? Literally, it stands for parents, friends, and families of lesbians and gays. Trans people weren't even really considered when PFLAG started 50 years ago. <laughs> Uh, but now PFLAG has taken on the mission of educating and supporting trans, our trans community as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great platform to be able to go in and talk to, to different groups about, about being trans. So the, the present and the future, what, I mean, what, what are your hopes? Um, well, um, quite surprisingly, I did fall in love with someone and I do have a partner now and she's wonderful. Um, and she knew I was trans from the beginning. Um, so I have grandkids. Um, I live in a beautiful place. I have wonderful friends um, and a great community, all of whom know me for who I am. I mean, it's, it is, it's the ultimate. I have a lot of privilege that a lot of my trans brothers and sisters don't have, and I'm aware of that. And it is part of also what motivates me to do what I can to try and try and get parents to understand about puberty blockers, fix, you know, doing something so kids don't have to go through puberty and come out the other side as somebody that they're not, and just the safety of that and the importance of that. Um, and I think you know, in some states we're making a difference. Mm -hmm. In some states we have a ways to go. We'll put the, the caption up, but is, is there a, a way that, are you okay for people to make contact with you? Absolutely. If they've got questions? Absolutely. Or? Be happy to have them do that. And yeah, though, I will give you the email, my PFLAG email, and contact me. I'm also happy to come out and speak to groups and talk about what we're talking about. Great. Well, thanks for sharing, sharing this Thank you. Really thanks for the opportunity, it. John. I appreciate it very much.